Hello audience, Mr. Z here, and boy oh boy do we have an exciting scenario for you today. Quite a while ago I covered this exact same scenario. It was only three minutes long I sounded like what if Halt hissed. It had so much potential to be more than it was. Since this video and many others are unavailable due to my EU ban, I've decided to pose the question once again. To not only restate what I've covered in that video, but to continue the story and flesh it out like I should have. So today we ask, what if Russia became fascist? Indeed, Russia was teetering between two major outcomes in the midst of the Russian Civil War. On one side stood the Reds, Bolsheviks backed by a number of leftist and sympathetic groups. On the other side stood the White Army under the unified leadership of Supreme Leader Admiral Alexander Kolchak, a Russian monarchist nationalist with xenophobic views toward the West and generally anything which was in Slavic. Kolchak was not a politician, nor a social man, describing himself as uncomfortable dealing with people. Kolchak was simply a naval admiral, and little more, a fact which would make him a poor choice to raise at the position of Supreme Leader of the White Army. Kolchak's Russian nationalism and poor communication skills would cost him every potential ally that fell into his lap, from the Czechoslovak Legion to Finland, from Britain to the United States, and even his fellow White Army generals. Except, Kolchak wasn't a general. Once again, Kolchak was not a land-based combatant. He was a Navy Admiral, and thus delegated his tactics to generals below him who would attempt to translate his commands into land tactics. All Kolchak had going for him was an indivisible determination to save and serve Russia from the Red Menace. All he'd think of in Act 4 would be Russia, and while he himself felt unsuitable for the position, it was a position he assumed knowing of no better alternative, and hoping that his efforts would be enough to reclaim the motherland. Unfortunately, Kolchak was betrayed by a legion of Czechoslovaks who had occupied a section of the Trans-Siberian Railway, promising him safe passage to link up with British allies, but instead turning him over to the Red Army, who promptly executed him following a show trial. With Kolchak gone, the White Army, who through him was at least loosely linked, broke into numerous segments which were swiftly crushed by Lenin and Trotsky's forces, bringing Russia under a red flag for the next several decades. But what if all that changed? What if Kolchak was just a better negotiator, simply someone who would have drawn upon the resources presented to him and not driven away valuable necessary allies, as well as be a voice which could more cohesively bind the White Army factions into a single focused force? Kolchak's reputation as a Russian chauvinist may still haunt him, but for this scenario, in addition to and as a byproduct of his improved diplomatic abilities, will grant that upon assuming position as Supreme Leader of Russia, Kolchak gives a rousing and stirring speech. One in which he acknowledges his lack of experience as a land general, in which he acknowledges he is an unliked man, but reminds the factions of the White Army and his allies across the world what is at stake, and why he has assumed this position which did not suit him but which no better qualified man could fill. The heart and future of Russia is on the line. A nation he loves and will do the impossible to protect at any cost from the communistic heathens who sought to disgrace the nation's body and steal its people as its own. A force which will not stop at Russia and will take down nation after nation. Protect Mother Russia, protect your motherland. A phrase which would touch upon the hearts of men across Europe to lend their arms to his effort and end the war for good. Kolchak was more than willing to march his troops through harsh conditions and could easily rally a fighting spirit in them through pure example, not expecting any more from his troops than he would expect from himself, and he was prepared to do absolutely anything for Russia. A bravado which would have surely made him a force to be reckoned with, especially once he tied together the White Army into a unitary force and earned the most likely support of the Poles, Finns, and Czechoslovaks, as well as resources provided by the United States and Great Britain. Come the Russian winter, Kolchak ordered an unexpected crushing push from the east and west to converge upon the communist strongholds. Historically, this winter had been Kolchak's greatest advance against the Bolsheviks, but this advance melted away with the snow. In this alternate timeline that changes, by late December of 1918, only a year after conflicts had started, the war would come to a close, and Kolchak would be celebrated as Russia's savior, earning his seat as supreme leader, while communists fled as far as they could, many being rounded up by the White Army and given the same treatment they had given to their captives. Kolchak, following meetings with Britain and France, agrees to recognize the sovereignty of Poland, Finland, and Czechoslovakia, while setting his focus to cleaning Russia of the Bolshevik remnants to create a Russian nation for the Russian people. At his side would rise monarchist Baron Ungern von Sternberg to personally eradicate remaining communist guerrilla fighters and serve as commanding general of the Russian army. 
Kolchak initiates a period of traditional revival and expels Western institutions he felt were polluting the minds of young Russians with communistic ideals, also restricting trade with Western nations, including allies Britain, France, and the US, making sole exceptions for weapons, natural resources, and food imports, something which would hinder Russia's development in most fields except for military, but help it retain a Russian identity free of Western influence. Industrialization projects would be initiated but progress far slower than in our timeline, not reaching that which the Soviets achieved for yet another decade. However, improvements in crop production and farming avert the famines which plagued Russia under Soviet rule, also meaning no collectivization of crop, meaning no peasant revolts, and no holodomor. This does mean that Ukraine has a larger population and thus there is more Ukrainian nationalism, which could lead to a long ongoing skirmish between Kolchak and the Ukraine, or perhaps a situation which could be resolved diplomatically by bestowing upon Ukraine increased autonomy to avert an unnecessary conflict, but this would be a best case scenario, and at any rate Kolchak's army could, if necessary, keep the Ukrainians in line, even if it meant continued occupation of the region and increased efforts of Russification across the new Russian state. The survivors of the old Red Front in Russia would migrate to post-war Germany, seeing opportunity to join the Spartacist movement, a communist front led by Karl Lieb still can't pronounce this name, and Rosa Luxemburg. This boosted the number, contributing to a more significant Spartacist uprising, which would briefly capture Berlin in a Paris Commune fashion, but would still be crushed by the government and anti-communist Freikorps. The uprising would take the lives of party leaders Karl and Rosa, but in their place would rise the escaped Trotsky. To Trotsky, the atmosphere of Weimar Germany evoked memories of post-revolutionary Russia. It reassured him that German soil was primed for total communist conversion, but the political left in Germany had both feet in the door. There was no need to force it open with violent revolution, only political maneuvering and social appeal were needed. Trotsky thus rebrands the Spartacists simply as the Communist Party of Germany, something Rosa Luxemburg had essentially done in our timeline, moving the party into a more Trotskyist direction and beginning mending ties with the ruling Socialist Democratic Party of Weimar Germany, or SPD. Trotsky was ambitious to place more of his own faction in seats of power to give Germany the full turn toward communism, inch by inch, and day by day. Back in the Russian Far East, pockets of communist insurgencies and entirely occupied towns still existed, previously being hunted down by General Sternberg, but whose focus was now shifted to the West where it was most needed and where the bulk of Russia's population remained. This meant Soviet-style living conditions for the poor souls encircled by Bolshevik remnants. Of these would be the case of a young man living in the Soviet-occupied city, Blagovenschensk. Only 14 years old at the time, Konstantin Rodzevetsky would be caught outside the warm arm of the restored Russian Empire. Learning how many had fled to the West, he felt abandoned by the Russian leadership. He and his family left to the Communists, enduring their treatment until the age of 18, when he would flee to Manchuria to study in the city of Harbin. It'd be at that university where amongst the law faculty, he'd fall in with the anti-Bolshevik group, the Russian Fascist Organization. As we return to Germany, we find a nation quietly undergoing the transformation into a Soviet state. The average citizen going quietly unaware as the heat is turned up gradually, but as every action triggers a reaction, so would the Nationalist Socialist German Workers' Party arise from the underground as a counter-movement to the growing communist presence in the government, which very soon could seize control. These two sides would shift the views of the German citizenry, and by the early 1930s, grossly divide the nation into the NSDAP East and the Communist Northwest, which, when the day came, would refuse to recognize Hitler's authority as Chancellor and threaten secession, something which would lead to a minor revolt, once again expelling the Communists and driving them off into Belgium and France, where finally they'd have the conditions necessary to create a Communist Union in the wake of the 1936 Workers' Uprising. Trotsky, collaborating with Majority Leader Leon Blum, would finally have his communist ambitions fulfilled, after being kicked out of two countries, of course. Germany goes about its typical trajectory as in our timeline, however, after annexing Austria and occupying Czechoslovakia, Hitler would be forced to face only Britain for his actions, since communist France would not be on proper speaking terms with Britain. In this timeline, instead of the simple appeasement which was granted to him in our timeline, Hitler uses France's turn toward communism as a bargaining chip to establish a closer relationship with Britain, so that they could jointly penalize the Bloom government in France. In exchange, he promises to take no further military action, but does still have his sights set on the old city of Danzig, now occupied by Poland. As in our timeline, there'd be negotiations for the land and offers to purchase it back by the German government, but Poland would reject them. 
Kolchak being the anti-Westerner he was would likely not support Hitler in a joint invasion of Poland, meaning for now, there'd be no invasion of Poland, as the joint invasion was meant as a means to both deflect blame and force Britain to declare war on both if war was declared on Germany, even though that didn't end up happening. Ultimately, the point of this is that Germany doesn't invade Poland and is stuck negotiating for Danzig, raising tensions between both countries, Germany potentially waiting for Poland to throw the first punch, so that Hitler could justifiably seize the land back without aggression from Britain. Returning to the East, Kolchak had done well to improve life in Western Russia, though at the cost of international relations, which grew strained due to his xenophobic beliefs and refusal to abide by the desires of foreign powers, most notably Britain. Regardless, Kolchak had succeeded in bringing about much-needed industrialization, and thus generating new jobs. He would also oversee an increase in crop production, as well as restoring a sense of national pride and unity amongst the regional Russian population, though the same could not be said of those in the Far East, who within their Soviet-occupied cities would endure even greater famine and laboring conditions than that which was seen in our timeline. By this point, we once again return to Konstantin Rodzavetsky, who has now established the Russian Fascist Party, absorbing the old Russian fascist organization and leading an order of some 30,000 men from his headquarters in Japanese-occupied Manchukuo. Rodzavetsky would have developed a strong alliance with the Japanese leaders, and through them would hold meetings with Adolf Hitler and Benito Mussolini. Japan had expressed interest in aiding the development of a allied fascistic Russian state in outer Manchuria. As well, Hitler believed Rodzavetsky could be useful as a replacement of the current Kolchak regime. In late 1939, Rodzavetsky would mobilize a force of 1,000 soldiers to spearhead a push into Soviet-occupied Amur. This push would be followed by a full onslaught of his 50,000-man army to occupy the entire far southeast. Hitler's plan would be to replace Kolchak with Rodzavetsky and lock Poland into a position of vulnerability in order to force it to cede any land Germany had desired without needing to declare a war. Officially, Germany was in peacetime, though was contributing significantly to ensure Rodzavetsky achieved power. Japan and the fascist Russian forces would be the ones to officially declare war on Kolchak, beginning what was for Germany a proxy war, but was for Russia another civil war. Though prosperous Russia may have become, it would be far behind industrially, and may not have the resources necessary to fight a war of this scale. Luckily, Kolchak's investment in military research and von Sternberg's training would have made the Russian White Army a highly capable force. Russia also faced the drawback of having tossed aside any noteworthy allies to call upon for help, while an unstable and aggressive Ukrainian population also held its grudge toward Kolchak. While this timeline averted the Second World War, this period would still see a number of independent wars break out. The French Commune, which had occupied a region of communist Spain following the Spanish Civil War, would now find itself at war with both Italy and Spain in the Fascisto-Communist War. Russia would be locked in both a Second Civil War and a Second Russo-Japanese War. The Japanese would also still bomb Pearl Harbor, meaning the beginning of an Americo-Japanese War. Though without the primary war going on in Europe to produce weaponry for, American industry, though still revived post Pearl Harbor, would lack the initial momentum and without shared British intelligence, which became necessary because of the war in Europe, the US would also develop the atomic bomb at a slower pace, meaning a resort to Operation Downfall, which was the slow and grueling campaign to fully occupy the Japanese islands by force. And that is where I'll end this video for now. The US of Z, thanks for watching. Support your legion by liking the video, or join our ranks by subscribing for more. Mr. Z, out.